Uh, the title of our talk today is Kubernetes Multi-Cluster Networking 101. Uh, I'm Naranjan. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft on the AKS traffic team working on managed Istio. Uh, and I'm Rob Venom. I'm one of the technical product managers at Solo.io where we have an API gateway solution called Blue Gateway that's built on, uh, it's based on Envoy and then a service mesh solution, a multi-cluster service mesh called Glue Mesh that's based on Istio. So um, in our session today, uh, we're going to be giving an overview of multi-cluster Kubernetes networking. Uh, we'll start off just talking about multi-cluster Kubernetes in general and some of the networking challenges involved. And then um, we'll provide some guidelines for how you can go about tackling these challenges across three core areas. Um, we'll start off with connectivity, so east, west, and north, south networking. Then uh, talk about service discovery and how to secure your multi-cluster traffic. And uh, finally, we'll end with some recommendations and takeaways for navigating this multi-cluster networking landscape and how to incorporate these different solutions that we discuss into your platform. Yeah, and pretty much everybody we talk to you know, has a multi-cluster strategy or they're working on a multi-cluster strategy. And when I say multi-cluster, you know, we don't just mean a different cluster for dev, test, prod, but instead deploying multiple clusters in production where you have services that are spanning across these multiple clusters and they need to be able to route to one another. And there's multiple reasons why people need this multi-cluster strategy. You know, they could be for uh, performance and latency reasons where you want to push your clusters closest to your, to, your end, to your end users, to your, to your clients. They could be because you want to delegate uh, to each one of your tenants. Like each one of your development teams might want to have their own Kubernetes cluster where they can own, like, own the entire lifecycle management of, uh, uh, of their code and process. You might have a, like a hybrid cloud strategy where you need to deploy clusters across different regions, maybe on-premise and public clouds. We've seen, we, we've seen like, you know, multiple different reasons why people uh, adopt a multi-cluster strategy. But you know, regardless of you know, what your strategy is, um, you, know, you definitely need to solve this ne network connectivity problem between the clusters. Um, like in, Tim Hawkins said uh, that you know, a Kubernetes cluster is like a, is like a city or a castle where inside the, the city you have roads, you have like a DMV, you have gates, you have all of the, you know, the benefits of like a city, but as soon as you leave the cluster, it's like you know, it's a jungle. So in order for you to connect these different like, cities together or these clusters together, you have to figure out like, what do you want to do? Do you want to build a, a, a road? Do you want to build a tunnel? Do you want to build a, a bridge? So you need to solve that network problem first, that connectivity problem of how you want to connect these clusters together. You know, once that's done, you need to figure out like, how do, you, how do your, your requests, how does your packets when they're going from a cluster to cluster, uh, how, are they encrypted? Is it, is it MTLS? How do you communicate securely? You need to resolve the problem of service discovery uh, and DNS across both of your clusters. And then, uh, you know, last but not least, things like, uh, like unified access control um, and, and load balancing logic. So these are all things you kind of have to resolve that, you know, that, you know, that Kubernetes single cluster you, you, you already have out of the box. Um, Kubernetes clusters were, like in my opinion, they were never designed uh, from the beginning to be grouped together uh, and, and form one big massive cluster. So there are a lot of these challenges that, um, that you kind of have to layer on top and address them. Um, uh, a common pattern that we see you know, when users go to, to go about solving this multi-cluster is that they just hairpin all traffic around this central external gateway. You know, like you know, something like, like Apogee, Akana, et cetera, like whatever your, your external outside of Kubernetes traffic, uh, there's like a gateway that sits there. And then whenever you have a new service come up in your cluster, they register that service to that API gateway. And it usually starts with just you know, a couple of services that just need this you know, like cross-cluster routing capability. But before you know it, all of your services start going towards that direction and it quickly just becomes the standard where uh, whether the service is in, in the same cluster sitting next to you in the same namespace or in a co totally different cluster, you're hairpinning around this. It, this is bad from like, you know, not only just like a latency perspective, but this is, you're introducing a single point of failure. It is less secure because, uh, you know, now you're probably doing TLS that's being terminated at the gateway. That gateway has to like uh, terminate that connection, do layer seven processing, and then route to it. So there's, there's multiple reasons why this strategy um, is probably not the best strategy for, for long-term multi-cluster adoption. 
So uh, thanks, Ram, for giving us an example of what not to do. Um, we're going to start from scratch and uh, figure out how we can improve that design. Um, and we're going to start out thinking about north-south traffic management. So uh, as Ram said, we don't want to hairpin um, all of our east-west traffic through the central gateway. But we do need some kind of global service load balancer that can distribute traffic across different clusters, in different regions, in different environments. Um, so one approach for global load balancing is an IP-based approach with Anycast. So um, if you're not familiar with Anycast, it is basically a routing method that allows a bunch of um, different edge proxies to share the same IP address. So in this example here, we have uh, edge proxy East US and edge proxy West US both sharing the same IP. Um, and the Anycast router is going to forward the incoming client request to one of these data centers, one of these edge proxies, um, usually based on some criteria like proximity to the client. Um, and then our edge proxy is going to route it to our ingress gateway that we have per cluster. Um, depending on the specific implementation that you use, uh, for instance, with some cloud providers, um, you might not even need that ingress gateway per cluster anymore, or it could be a private ingress gateway, um, because the edge proxy can just route to your um, backend application directly, or the, the multi-cluster gateway can route to it directly. Uh, the other method for global load balancing is a DNS-based approach. So uh, in this example, we're using external DNS. External DNS is a tool that uh, automates the provisioning of DNS records and allows you to expose Kubernetes services through a public DNS server. An external DNS can also integrate with uh, DNS servers like Azure DNS, AWS Route 53, and it can provide functionalities like weighted routing or geolocality-based routing. So um, in this example, we have two uh, ingress gateways with the same host name. But uh, in the external DNS manifest, they are given different owner IDs. And uh, what the DNS server is doing is that it is uh, handling the geolocality-based routing. So it is forwarding uh, the, the request either to, it is route, it is resolving the appropriate IP address, either in East US or West US, depending on the uh, originating client request. Um, in terms of which approach you go with, like the Anycast approach in the previous slide or this one, um, it depends on what your cloud provider offers, but uh, the DNS-based approach uh, seems to be a bit more common. So we figured out how to do global load balancing. Um, now we need to solve the east-west communication problem. So let's say you have two clusters. Um, how do you enable connectivity to get traffic from one cluster to another? And what if these clusters are, are, are in different networks? And uh, by the way, when we're talking about networks here, we're referring to um, the virtual networks that the, uh, that the VMs of the worker nodes of our Kubernetes cluster are part of. Or maybe if you're running bare metal, these would be physical machines. Um, but to answer this question, we have to understand different network topologies. So the first network topology is a flat network. Um, so uh, you could deploy uh, two clusters into the same network. Um, or you could use some kind of peering feature to establish direct connectivity between the different networks. So your pods can communicate directly with one another without any kind of gateway or any kind of NAT. Um, so the core requirements of this is that you have uh, non-overlapping address spaces in the two networks uh, for routability between them. Uh, so one caveat to keep in mind uh, with the peering approach is that if your pods are on an overlay network, so you're not using something like VPC, CNI, um, then you won't have uh, direct routability between your pods across clusters like you would your nodes. Um, so one workaround here is you could use a gateway-based approach like we will see with the multi-network topology. Um, or if you're using a CNI like Cilium or Calico that supports cluster mesh and that can also do some kind of tunneling, um, or you're using Submariner, which uh, creates an IPsec tunnel um, uh, across the clusters, then that will effect that'll effectively just flatten the pod networks and allow that pod-to-pod -pod communication. The other network topology is a multi-network topology. So here, our networks are separate and isolated. Um, this gives us a bit more flexibility in terms of um, IP address management. Unlike a flat network, we don't have to worry about the requirement of, of non-overlapping um, address spaces. And typically, this would use a gateway 
uh, to send traffic across networks, um, usually over the public internet. Um, this can be a cloud provider gateway, or it could be something like a network gateway or an east-west gateway provided by um, Istio or Linkerd. So as an example of what a multi-network topology would look like, we see that our east-west traffic um, is being served by uh, this network gateway and then it's routing to the appropriate service accordingly. Um, this gateway would typically be exposed through a public IP address, but um, that may not always be the case. There are a few exceptions. Um, and the reason why we have a dedicated east-west gateway, and we're not just using the ingress gateway, uh, is because we don't want to flood the ingress gateway with um, north-south traffic from external clients, as well as east-west traffic um, across our clusters. Uh, in terms of which topology to choose, um, each one has its own trade-offs. So flat networks, or, or um, either in the same VPC or VNet or, uh, or through some kind of peering, um, it provides a, a high bandwidth, low latency connection, and all the communication is private. It's through your cloud providers, um, usually through the backbone infrastructure. Um, the downside is because of the IP address management requirements, um, you typically need a, a large number of IPs reserved if you have a, a lot of clusters in your setup though IPv6 can help circumvent that. Um, and also, if you have to deal with a lot of peering connections uh, to flatten your networks, then um, that becomes harder to manage in, in the large setups with many clusters. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the multi-network setup, as I mentioned earlier, you get more flexibility um, with your address ranges, and uh, you get better network isolation um, between your clusters. Uh, but you also need to account for the additional hop from the gateway, as well as uh, the fact that in most cases, your traffic is going to be uh, traversing the public internet. So to illustrate just the limitation of peering and establishing flat networks across many clusters, uh, we can see that it kind of leads to this n squared problem, where um, every network requires um, peering to another network that it wants to communicate to. And uh, this is referred to as a full mesh network architecture. Uh, whereas if we just had multi-network and we had east-west gateways, then uh, we don't have to worry about all these peering connections. Um, the one exception uh, is for Google. Um, with GKE, you could have, uh, obviously, a global VPC, and uh, then you can have um, clusters deployed across the world in different regions within that VPC. Yeah. So uh, another thing that, that you have to consider when you're you know, building your network together is, is load balancing. So just like you have load balancer at the, at the edge when traffic is coming in north-south, now if you're routing traffic east-west, you need to consider load balancing for that as well. If you don't, then you're basically saying that you just want to round robin between the local pods and, and, the, and the pods in remote clusters. And, and that might work if you know, they're all in the same you know, region and latency is not a concern, but most often you need additional like, heuristics that you want to apply on top and say that I want to stick to the local um, instances of the service, and only if that fails, I want to I want to go to the next closest zone or next closest region. Or you might have your own like custom uh, policies you might want to apply based on the workload where it should fail over. And, and talking about failover, you also need to define under what conditions do you want to fail over. Just because um, you get a 500 from you know one of the pods doesn't mean that you should immediately fail over to the U.S. West. US West pod you know, instead of the local one, right? So you might need to define, okay, I need, if it fails 10 times in, uh, in a five second period, then I'm gonna take that endpoint out of my load balancing pool and fail over. And if you have these requirements, then you're approaching a territory where, okay, you need some, some sort of proxy in between, like a service mesh proxy in between that's able to make these, these advanced uh, load balancing and failover decisions for you. Cool, so next topic, um, you know, we covered networking, and next we wanna talk about service discovery and DNS. Um, in, in a local Kubernetes cluster, you get this FQDN, right, where it's based on like an organizational like hierarchy, where it's like you have a service name, and then you have the namespace, and then you have basically the, the cluster domain. But when you wanna go multi-cluster, uh, the same topology doesn't, the, the same FQDN doesn't quite always make sense. You might want to do, um, the service here is orders, right? So you might wanna do orders.uswest.mycompany.com, 
to refer to a set of clusters that are in US West. Or you might want to be very explicit about the cluster name, and you might want to put the cluster name directly in the DNS. Or you might want to just say um, service.global or service.cluster set and, and have that figure out wherever it needs to go. So that's another consideration. Like, what are your requirements for to do multi-cluster? Uh, if you have just a couple of clusters in a single uh, region, then it might be like, you know, the default might work for you or like a cluster set might work for you. But if you have like 50 clusters or 100 clusters around the world, then your applications might need more custom DNS logic. And the reason why we bring up all these things to consider is because you know, there's different uh, service mesh implementations and CNI-based implementations that, that, that give you different levels of functionality. So when you're evaluating them, you need to consider these factors. Um, a lot of solutions, a lot of those service mesh or CNI-based multi-cluster solutions build on this concept of a namespace sameness. So these like set of assumptions that it can make to, to make this DNS uh, and service discovery and service registry population easier. And namespace sameness basically just means that if you have a multi-cluster environment and you have two namespaces, or you have a namespace that's named the same across two clusters, then just assume that they're the same thing, meaning they're under the same like administrative domain, and then that gives you, that assumption gives you certain, um, certain additional capabilities that the, the, the tool can provide you. For example, if it, the first one, the front end workload is in two, two namespaces that are called the same thing. So maybe you wanna just group them together automatically and it should be part of the same load balancing pool. The, the second example, uh, two different services, catalog and, and orders, they're on the same namespace. So maybe like that means that the export and import, like they should be able to talk to one another uh, by default. So you can take the endpoints of one and automatically populate them uh, in, in the other cluster and have that um, uh, both from like an authorization, authorization perspective, but also a uh, service discovery perspective. And then the last, uh, the last namespace, you know, it's the, the database is under uh, a namespace uh, called like uh, DB East and DB West. And that means treat them as they're not the same thing. Like this database needs affinity to that cluster. Do not group them and start load balancing between them. So the, using namespace sameness, a lot, of, uh, a lot of tools make some assumptions and give you um, good uh, load balancing capabilities. Yeah, we've, we've just listed like some of the different implementations you can use for multi-cluster. Um, we, we recognize that there's more. Uh, you know, we're gonna use these as more of like a generalization to show you some of the different patterns uh, and how they go about implementing them. Um, you, know, for this, you know, for the sake of this being a one-on-one class, this, this is gonna oversimplify some of these concepts, but you know, just like learn the patterns but not the very specific details that we might uh, kind of gloss over. Um, so service meshes and CNIs, right, when you, when you group together multiple clusters, they need to know what are the pod IPs that back a particular service in all of the different clusters. Uh, a typical way they go about doing this, like Istio multi-primary, multi-network, uh, is a common Istio multi-cluster pattern. The way it goes about doing this is that in every cluster, that control plane, that Istio control plane, or that, that Celium control plane will reach out to the Kubernetes API servers in, in the other clusters, and it will get that service discovery information, and as well as, you know, that service discovery information is, is not just the service name, but all the pods that back it, the health of it, et cetera. So as you can imagine, you know, this works for like a few clusters, but, you know, as your clusters start growing, you know, having every control plane talk to the Kubernetes API server of all the other control planes to get this information, you know, quickly goes, grows uh, out of hand. So there's definitely solutions to that problem, um, you know, like an external control plane that is doing these things. And like uh, the product that I work on, Glue Mesh, is one such example uh, that orchestrates things like that. Um, even for like an east-west gateway case where they're not on a flat network, this is a multi-network case where there's an east-west gateway that backs uh, every single or that fronts every single cluster, the control plane would still need to reach out to the other clusters, you know, get that east-west gateway IP address, get the services that back that, and then populate it in the local service registry. Um, as far as DNS, you know, we talked about uh, building custom DNS names, you know, depending on you know what your what your organizations need to be able to route to the correct destinations. Uh, it, Service meshes like Istio has, um, has what's called the smart DNS proxy inside of it. So it's a DNS proxy, meaning that you can create a custom DNS entry uh, 
and that DNS entry, you can use it to back the remote cluster east-west gateway IP address. And when your application calls that, that host name, you're not leveraging Kubernetes DNS at all. The Envoy sidecar will intercept that connection and, and provide a DNS proxy. So it will resolve that, that, that DNS name to the east-west gateway IP address, and traffic will leave the pod directly to that east-west gateway IP without the, the application container knowing that anything, um, anything like that is, uh, is, is happening. Um, even, if, even if you're using the new Istio ambient mode where it doesn't have sidecars and it's using like a node level Z tunnel to accomplish service mesh, there is a DNS proxy inside that as well that, that you can use with Istio to get the same DNS proxy functionality if you want that advanced uh, DNS capabilities. In complete contrast of like, you know, one end of the solution would be Istio where you have full set of capabilities. If you were to go the total other end, it would be a solution like Scupper where it basically just sets up a router between two namespaces. So you, know, you, you have a namespace in cluster one and like a namespace in cluster two. Scupper is a very easy way for you to set up a router on here and set up a router on there. And those two routers just talk to one another and they populate service discovery information uh, between each other. So it's a very good point-to-point -point solution if, you're, if you have like a very specific use case or very specific application that just wants multi-cluster capabilities. And you can just do everything in a particular namespace and not involve your platform engineering teams for a full cluster-wide solution. And the way that works is it, it, it leverages the, the, the primitives of Kubernetes. Uh, whenever, in this example, if you expose workload B, if you expose service B globally, then Scupper will create a service on the other cluster, on, on the cluster east, and then it will just back the router for that service. So now whenever somebody calls that service, the traffic will actually go to the router, the Scupper router on that US east cluster, and it will do MTLS connection to the Scupper router on the destination cluster, and then it will route back to the, to the, the originating destination. So uh, the implementations that um, Ram was just discussing, um, those typically have their own APIs to handle the service discovery and cross-cluster load balancing. But there is um, a Kubernetes native API uh, called the Multi-Cluster Services API by SIG Multi-Cluster uh, that's been gaining um, a lot of traction recently. So uh, the core concepts of MCS include a cluster set. So a cluster set is a set of clusters that share a high degree of trust among one another, as well as a set of services for uh, cross-cluster communication. Um, you also have the service export, which defines a service that's, um, that's meant to be exported to uh, all of the clusters in your cluster set. And then that leads to the creation of a service import in all of the clusters in the cluster set. Um, you also need some kind of controller uh, the MCS controller that uh, adheres to the spec uh, defined by the SIG multi-cluster group. Um, definitely, uh, on your own time, check out um, uh, the upstream specification to learn more about that. Um, but that's watching for the service, imp uh, service exports, and that's creating the service imports and, and the endpoints on, on um, all of the uh, clusters across the cluster set. And you also need some kind of DNS plugin uh, for instance, the core DNS multi-cluster plugin um, that can also create the DNS records for the multi-cluster services. So this is just uh, one example of what an MCS implementation could look like. Um, so uh, we have a service export being defined for the order service. Uh, the MCS controller sees that and it creates service imports um, on all of the clusters in the cluster set. And the core DNS multi-cluster plugin sees that service um, import, um, sees the corresponding uh, cluster set IP, and uh, that creates a new um, DNS record. And if you notice, uh, this is in a different uh, domain, the cluster set.local domain. Um, so now, if services want to consume uh, that multi-cluster service, uh, then they invoke that FQDN within the uh, within the cluster set.local domain. Um, so this is just one example. Uh, definitely uh, uh, see the upstream specification to learn more about uh, the MCS API and possible implementations. Uh, so yeah, there are a few open source and cloud provider options that uh, implement it. Um, just a caveat that some of the cloud provider options, such as uh, GKE and AKS, 
Uh, they have their own implementations of MCS on top of the upstream one, but um, overall the user experience is essentially the same. Okay, so we discussed connectivity and we discussed service discovery. Uh, now we actually need to secure our um, multi-cluster communication. So the first aspect of security we want to consider is uh, the security related to the overall network architecture and the security offerings um, given by the cloud provider. So we discussed some of this when we're discussing flat versus multi-network topologies. So with a flat network, um, you have the benefit of all of your communication being private. Um, and if you don't want to expose all of your um, uh, endpoints directly through some kind of peering, you could use a private link service or a private endpoint service um, but if you want stronger network isolation, um, say for a PCI environment with uh, tighter security controls, then you can keep that network isolated and um, apply uh, uh, tighter security restrictions to, to that network. Um, if you're using some kind of VPN gateway or transit gateway, uh, most of those would provide encryption across cluster through, um, through a secure tunnel, so uh, another layer of security there. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in, in terms of uh, firewalls and your network security rules is, um, for instance, we talked about for the multi-network topology, you might need an east-west gateway with a public IP address. If you're doing that, um, you definitely want to lock down access to that east-west gateway so that it's only for cross-cluster traffic. And um, as Ram was mentioning, for the endpoint and service aggregation for multi-cluster services, um, or multi-cluster service mesh, the controller needs to read the Cube API server of all of the clusters in your setup. Um, so you uh, want to allow for that API server access across all of your clusters in, uh, in your fleet or your cluster set, but um, you still want to make sure that access to the API server is restricted. Um, talking about like pod to pod communication, uh, at a minimum, when you're doing multi cluster, you need to have some sort of like layer three and layer four um, uh, like network policies in place so that you can restrict who's allowed to talk to who, right? Like I think uh, a network policy is like the like the first like layer, you know, when you're building a multi defense uh, architecture for for your security model, and um, using like a Cilium network policy allows you to to at least establish that as uh, as your base primitive when you're building your zero trust. But as you continue building more uh, more levels of security, you know, then if you need MTLS strong identity for all of your workloads, regardless of where they're running, then you need a traditional service mesh, right? Um, the, the way a traditional service mesh works in, in terms of providing you that, that strong identity and encryption is whenever there's a new workload that comes up in, in, any of your, in any of your environments, in any of your clusters, there's a CA, there's like a control plane. Uh, Istio acts as a control plane by default and it acts as the CA by default and provides these strong identities to every single workload. So, that is a, is, a, is a spiffy format ID. It's every workload has like an SVID and it's encapsulated in like an X509 cert. So whenever a workload comes up, it gets a strong certificate. Um, in a multi-cluster environment, you have to do the same thing, right? Like uh, there needs to be a CA that is providing these strong identities across all of your workloads. And these workloads, typically there's like this concept of a trust domain. So, which basically is an organizational grouping of all identities inside that inside that group can can trust one another. So, when they're doing when they're talking with each other, as long as they're from the same trust domain, then you can make assumptions that yep, MTLS connections between them can can happen. If you're doing multi-cluster, now you need to make sure that you're setting your trust domain appropriately, and um, and the most simplest one is just to create one big trust domain across. Uh, multiple clusters. Um, you can do uh, multiple trust domains with Istio, but you know then you're having to do the uh, the manual exchanges of trust bundles uh, using using the root CA where you're unifying the trust. But you know organizations that have large amount of Kubernetes clusters probably also have 
uh, like an enterprise workload identity solution. And like, you know, that's something like Spiffy, where it implements the, uh, sorry, that's uh, Spire, which implements the Spiffy um, uh, spec, but it gives you a way to provide strong identities, regardless of what that workload type is. It doesn't have to be Kubernetes workloads, it could be like other, um, you know, other workloads, other endpoints, et cetera. And, and if you're building this multi-cluster architecture, you probably want to integrate your workloads into that same organizational model. Uh, service mesh solutions like Istio allow you to just plug in directly with Spire, where you can stand up a Spire server directly in every one of your clusters and, and delegate the, the attestation, the workload attestation responsibilities to Spire instead of Istio. And then these Spire servers can take care of exchanging uh, like trust bundles, which is like very native to, to Spire. Um, again, like in complete contrast, like it would, you know, for a solution like Scupper to do multi-cluster routing, you're not getting pod-to-pod -pod MTLS. Like you're not getting traffic directly from workload A going to workload B getting MTLS. Instead, traffic is going to Scupper. Scupper will do MTLS between each other. Um, but but it's not, by default, you're not getting full MTLS end-to-end. -end. Um, I'll, I'll note that you can put Scupper on top of something like Istio where you have like MTLS and like, you know, kind of both ends and between, but it's, again, it won't be like an end-to-end -end -end connection. Um, we're, as we're you know wrapping up, you know I'll I'll talk about some of like the the, the caveats, the best practices, and first uh, around security. Um, when you're evaluating these various multi-cluster solutions, um, you know we talked about the pattern where every single control plane needs to talk to the Kubernetes API of, of other clusters. You know that means that there's some sort of credentials that you're giving every single cluster. You know like be careful with that. You know that might be an, like a security no-go from the, from from day one. Um, you know, to be able to provide Kube API access to other clusters, even if it's just read-only, you know, that's something that a security team might, might not even allow from the beginning. Um, selective service exposure, don't federate all services to all clusters, like, you know, even if that's, the, the tooling might allow you to do that by default, you know, that's, that's pretty dangerous to do and it can have unintended consequences. Be very selective about what services uh, you want to expose and consume in other clusters, uh, both from a scale and a security perspective. Uh, do the layered security model. Uh, use the CNI network policies to enforce like layer three, layer four. What IPs are allowed to talk to which east-west gateway? Like what IP range is allowed to what, talk to what east-west gateway? And then, um, and then also leverage a service mesh on top so you're getting a strong identity in MTLS where you can lay down Istio authorization policies where you can finally define who is allowed to talk to what. Um, and, it's, and, and, and take that zero trust posture and apply those policies. And then uh, last but not least, uh, if you're building a multi-cluster solution, you probably want a unified way to control um, your access uh, policies, like some central place where it's the source of truth where you define who's allowed to talk to what and under what conditions and have some tool or some tooling convert that to lower level policies that get distributed to each one of the clusters. Don't hand that responsibility off to your development teams to, to, to enforce. If you're doing a multi-cluster solution, you need to take the platform engineering approach. So um, we've covered a lot in this presentation, um, north, south, east, west networking, and um, security, service discovery, uh, various tools um, and APIs that you could use to achieve that. So uh, we wanted to end by just giving some recommendations and takeaways for uh, navigating this landscape down the road and um, how to go about incorporating these different tools into your platform and how to decide which of these tools are more relevant for you. So uh, here's a set of criteria you probably want to consider, but uh, this is not an um, all-inclusive list. There are probably several others. Um, but uh, one thing to think about, for instance, is, is scale. Um, so if you have a smaller setup, uh, you might just prefer the simplicity of peering and not worrying about um, east-west gateways and just need to worry about the security aspect. Um, but for larger setups, um, again, due to the IP exhaustion issue and some of the scalability um, issues that mentioned earlier, um, you probably want a multi-network setup using east-west gateways to address that. Um, it's also important to assess uh, what core features and functionalities do you need. So, um, for instance, if you have a replicated architecture where your services 
are replicated identically across all of the clusters in your cluster set. Um, maybe you just need to solve the north-south problem. Um, you don't need uh, that much, if any, east-west. Or you only need a few services uh, doing east-west communication, in which case something like, like Scupper could su uh, suffice. But uh, the other architectural pattern would be uh, split by service architecture, where you have different services split across um, all of the clusters. Uh, in that case, um, that probably warrants more advanced uh, east-west uh, failover and load balancing behavior, in which case you probably want to leverage something like a traditional application layer seven service mesh. Uh, one of the other uh, great benefits of the service mesh is that they solve all three of those core requirements, uh, connectivity, um, service discovery, and security, uh, all in one. Um, uh, and they provide various other benefits like um, observability and, and advanced layer seven load balancing. So again, a great way to tackle all those problems in one and provide a lot of features out of the box. Um, on the other hand, if you want to work with something that feels more like working with Kubernetes primitives, like services, then uh, a controller that implements the MCS API might be uh, a better fit for you. So um, here's a high-level comparison of some of the different uh, multi-cluster networking projects that we discussed. Um, don't have time to go into too much depth here, but uh, yeah, feel free to take a picture. Um, but as you can see, these various solutions um, have their own trade-offs uh, in terms of security and overall complexity and overall feature set. And obviously, uh, different um, people might have different interpretations of this. Um, so uh, for instance, uh, Scupper is rather trivial to uh, set up, um, but it doesn't offer many of the fine-grained uh, routing, or as Ram explained, uh, some of the more advanced security features. Um, on the other hand, uh, Istio multi-cluster, at least for the sidecar-based model, is um, non-trivial to set up, to say the least, but part of that is because it provides so many different deployment models, so many different advanced um, security and load balancing behaviors. Um, so it's a great option for uh, complex setups that have uh, more complex needs. Um, and it's not always either or. Uh, in some cases, uh, you might use something like Istio or Linkerd, uh, along with Submariner, or Submariner, however you pronounce it. And uh, that can just uh, flatten uh, the pod networks across your clusters, but you still get the benefits of a service mesh. Um, some final thoughts and takeaways. Um, you know, I would, like I said before, I would say like empower uh, a platform engineering team. Uh, you know, when you're evaluating these different solutions, uh, start with uh, figuring out what your core business case is and what you're trying to solve across the, the entire organization, across all of your clusters, across all your development teams, and 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 then leverage a platform engineering model where there's like a cent like a like a central team that is in charge of deploying whatever solution is necessary. Um, like we believe in, in like incremental adoption of a multi-cluster strategy, but, uh, but that doesn't mean allow your developers to build bespoke solutions that you have to then rip out when, like, when you run into a security issue or when you run into like, um, like advanced load balancing issue that, you know, that wasn't thought about. Um, we've, I have experience working with very large customers that have implemented this as massive scale. They, they have a central platform engineering team. It's a small team that have built abstractions on top of a service mesh so that their developers, their application teams don't know that a service mesh is running or that they don't know that there's even a multi-cluster um, environment. They're just, you know, they just go to some Git repo, they bootstrap some config, or, and they just essentially check box, yep, I want failover, I want this functionality. And then the service mesh config or the, uh, the multi-cluster config, whatever it is, is basically just configuration that gets packaged up into their Helm chart that they don't even know that you know, it's doing you know, whatever it's doing. So like service meshes, yes, it's hard when, when, when you're trying to do it yourself for the entire organization. But you know, when, when you do it as a, as a standard and an abstraction layer and integrate it into your, um, into your IDP, it does, not, it does not have to be hard. But then again, like, you know, I'm, I am pretty biased. Uh, I've been working on Istio for the last five, six years. Yeah. And uh, just some additional resources if you want to download the slides. It's available on the, the KubeCon website. Um, you know, feel free to take a look at this for further reading. But um, yeah, that was it for our presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending.